Today, the Matt Wall Show, a drag queen is invited on the altar during a church service, but the pastor's justification for this satanic display tells us more than I think he intended to reveal. Also, Antifa mobilizes for my event at the University of Houston in a few days. Tulsi Gabbard leaves the Democrat Party. The Secretary of the Army says the Army isn't woke, it's just um, inclusive, which is like the same thing. In our daily cancellation, Michelle Obama is teaming up with an organization that just put out the worst get out the vote ad in the history of democracy. All of that and more today on The Matt Walsh Show. You know, chain stores have different price tiers for professional mechanics and do-it-yourselfers, but rockauto.com's prices are the same for everybody, and they're reliably low for everybody. Rockauto.com always lows, offers the lowest prices possible, rather than changing prices based on what the market will bear like airlines do. Rockauto.com is a family-owned business serving auto part customers online for 20 years. You can go to rockauto.com to shop for auto and body parts from hundreds of manufacturers, they have everything from engine control modules and brake parts to tail lamps, motor oil, and even new carpet. So whether it's for your classic or your daily driver, you can get everything you need with just a few easy clicks delivered straight to your door. The rockauto.com catalog is remarkably easy to navigate. Best of all, the prices are at rockauto.com are reliably low. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need, rockauto.com. Go to rockauto.com right now and see all the parts available for your car or truck. Uh, at rockauto.com. And be sure to write Walsh in their How Did You Hear About Us box so they know that I sent you. My What Is a Woman college tour continues this week. I'll be screening the film at the University of Central Florida tonight and then moving on to the University of Houston. Now, the Houston event is apparently already uh, creating serious tension on campus as the Houston ABC affiliate reports. Watch. Clash of ideas could reach a boiling point Thursday at the University of Houston. Controversial conservative Matt Walsh is speaking and showing his new movie. Some in the trans community believe the film is an attack on them. Because of this, they're planning their very own event. But as ABC 13's Nick Natario discovered, it's one of the conservative group welcomes. A lot of eyes will be on this U of H building Thursday night. Inside, a speaker brought by a conservative student group will showcase a new film. We believe as college students on a college campus that that view is the minority. We believe that a majority of students do believe in genders, do believe in the difference between man and woman. Outside, a protest is expected to take place. This is, in my opinion, not a freedom of speech issue. Um, but rather a hate speech and a safety issue. The concern by some in the trans community is the topic of the speaker, Matt Walsh's movie. It's called What is a Woman? Walsh says it's a look at the gender ideology movement. Trans activists say it's a film that attacks them and others who perform gender reaffirming procedures. Eden Rose Torres, who's a trans woman, worries this film could generate anger towards her community. I'm going to be extremely worried about the students of University of Houston, the students and the faculty. I, they do not deserve to feel this unsafe and be put at this much risk. Now, I just want to clarify that when I have described the film as a bombshell documentary, I didn't mean it literally. So you're not going to be in any physical danger whatsoever, I promise you. Also, when I say that audiences have been blown away and left stunned by the movie, um, which is true. These are also not meant to be taken as actual physical descriptions of their reactions. These are um, metaphors. And hopefully that will put your, your mind at ease. Though I suspect that that's not the source of the confusion here. As we've covered, when they say unsafe, they mean that their understanding of the world and of themselves is vulnerable when it's made to confront contrary viewpoints. So they say unsafe, but they mean uh, really destabilized. Their conception of reality is fragile. It's perched precariously at the top of a stack of wholly unsupported and arbitrary assertions and, and presuppositions. Um, they're terrified of anything that threatens to knock the whole tower over. That's what they mean. Now, there is something perhaps ironic about this crippling fear on the left, given that the left's great project is to itself destabilize and destroy, knocking over whatever it can topple. So for a good example of this, we go elsewhere in Florida to Allendale Methodist Church in St. Petersburg, which recently played host to a drag queen during Sunday services. And this uh, video has gone viral. The drag queen goes by the stage name Penny Cost, obviously a sacrilegious play on the sacred Christian holiday of Pentecost. But his real name is Isaac Simmons, and he's a candidate for ordination in the um, United Methodist Church. He's an associate pastor. 
He's also an atheist who proclaims that the Bible and God are, quote, nothing. Simmons makes these declarations in a slam poetry performance posted to his website where he proves that his imitation of a poet is even less convincing than his imitation of a woman. Listen. Look, the Bible, the Bible is nothing. Nothing but poetry, pain, and performance. The Bible is no more holy than Allen Ginsberg's Howls of Life, no more peaceful than Oscar Wilde's Requiescat and Pache, and no more stronger than Tammy Faye's eyelash glue. God himself is no more tangible than the concophony of invisible butterflies floating in new lovers' stomachs yearning to be set free from the bondage of past harm and the lacks of rightful mistrust. God himself is nothing. But if she were, she would be, yes, Cleaning her way down the runways of Paris and Montreal, strutting on that tightrope pulled taut between absurdity and opulence, balancing between too much and never enough. There's a lot of uh, cheap blasphemy going on there, but let us not allow the heretical nonsense to distract us from the fact that the poetry, judged on its own merits, is extremely bad. No more tangible than the cacophony of butterflies floating in new lovers' stomachs yearning to be set free. This is the kind of line that a student in a community college creative writing class might come up with and then hopefully be expelled for right on the spot. It's cliche upon cliche. If I were to, if I were to utilize my own poetic metaphor, I would say that this guy has the intellectual depth of uh, an inflatable kiddie pool tinted with urine and pockmarked with dead beetles and horseflies floating on the surface. Not exactly Shakespearean either, but at least it's uh, a little bit more descriptive. In any case, Isaac Simmons, uh, the atheist drag queen pastor, showed up to perform to perform at a, a fake church in Florida a few days ago. Two young girls were brought up on the satanic altar to be used as props for this display. And then this conversation unfolded. Do either of you have any questions for Ms. Pentecost? Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, you like her eyeshadow. That's great. Yeah, yeah. Maybe she'll let you borrow it when you're older, like when you're allowed to wear makeup. Just, yeah. Yeah. yeah, of course. Yes. Yeah. Well, one of the things I think is great about Miss Pentecost is she reminds us that we we follow a God who calls us to not conform to things of this world. Uh, that we're supposed to be transformed by the renewal of our minds, and that means that what I think today may have to change tomorrow if I continue to renew my mind. And it's so cool that we serve a God that calls us to continue to grow and continue to, to change into something new uh, and to not be bound by the ways that the world confines us sometimes, that, that we're supposed to live differently. Now, the apostate preacher there is referring to and hideously mangling Romans 12, 2, which indeed warns us against conforming to things of this world uh, and calls for the renewal of our minds. What this actually means in, our, in, in context, if you read the sentences before and after it, is that we must live in a way that is, quote, holy and pleasing to God, and we must use, quote, sober judgment and avoid falling into pride and self-regard. We're told to conform ourselves to the body of Christ, love what is good and hate what is evil. That's what, that's what the whole verse says. Um, the verse, in other words, warns against precisely the sort of display we just witnessed. Drag is, among other things, profane, ostentatious, self-focused, prideful, absurd. It is anything but the product of humility and sober judgment. It's the opposite of the verse that the pastor uses to defend it. And of course, most importantly, Drag is not a rejection of the things of this world. It, it is a thing of this world. It's a product of the decadence and moral insanity of modern American culture. It's hard to think of something that's more of the world than that. It's also a, 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 a trend and a marketing gimmick. It is all of the things that Romans chapter 12 tells us to reject. But what the pretend pastor at the pretend church is really trying to say is that drag, especially when mixed with church or with children, 
or with both at the same time, is meant to break down barriers. It's an attempt to um, destroy or at least weaken cultural guide rails and fences that have been put in place. And that is certainly true. This this is all the left does, after all. Um, Except that the barriers the left breaks down are barriers barriers of basic human decency, of um, intellectual and moral coherence, of objective truth. It silences the voice of tradition, tears down all that was built by our ancestors, simply because it was built by our ancestors. Therefore, it must be bad, they, they reason. That's what drag is about. It's what gender ideology is about. It's what critical race theory is about. It's what everything on the left is about. This is a sort of renewal that the pastor was talking about. Now, people on the left, they, they might even agree with most of my characterization up to this point. Yes, they'll proudly proclaim, we are fearlessly tearing down barriers and we're, we're claiming our independence and our autonomy because we're not conformists like the rest of you. But what they leave out is that the old barriers, you know, those barriers that made sense and which were rooted in natural law and objective truth and uh, traditions stretching back through the ages, they are not knocked down to reveal a wider and wilder landscape where people are free to just roam and do whatever they want. No, the old barriers are simply replaced with new ones. And the new ones, it turns out, are far more restricting and constricting. They're also arbitrary and intellectually indefensible. So, The barrier, which says that you should, you know, you shouldn't include children in your cross-dressing performance, that goes away, for instance. We're tearing that one down. But a new one, which says that you should not show a popular documentary on a college campus, is put in its place. So you could dress and drag and dance around kids, uh, but you can't show a documentary dealing with a serious subject to a bunch of college students. All sorts of new restrictions are put in place. New fences are built. The new ones are all tenuous. They're all fragile. They blow over in a slight breeze. And whenever they do, a million screaming harpies will burst into tears, claiming that if we don't respect these new boundaries, people will die. So what's the lesson here? We leave the old ways behind, but we're not freer, it turns out. Far from it. Now let's get to our five headlines. Another quick note about my Houston event. This is from Andy No. I just saw this uh, report pop up. So he says, he reports, uh, Antifa in the Houston area are rallying comrades to try and stop Matt Walsh from speaking at the University of Houston on October 13th. The Screwston Antifa group has claimed responsibility for recent violence outside the KD Texas church raising uh, money to help transition children. So that's what they're, they're saying. They're going to mobilize. They're going to show up at, uh, at this screening of the film. And it's a film that uh, they, in particular, need to see. Um, it, here's what they, they posted st- uh, on their social media platforms. Stop transphobia at UH. Although it's kind of funny because it says stop transphobia at, at UH. And it kind of reads, like at first it reads as stop transphobia at a. Uh, And then it looks like they just lost their train of thought and forget where they're supposed to stop transphobia. But anyway, rally and protest, Thursday, October 13th, 6.30 p.m. Um, On Thursday, far-right bigot and transphobe Matt Walsh will be on campus. We must oppose his hate. The majority of UH students and workers reject this hatred. We must organize the largest possible counter-protest to make sure Matt Walsh and other bigots know they're unwelcome. Uh, so they're going to try to show up and, and uh, stop the screening from happening and stop me from speaking. Now, it's impossible. Like, that's not going to happen on my end. I can tell you that right now. Like, there's nothing that they can say or threaten that would make me say, well, maybe we shouldn't show up. Now, whether this, as it's intended to do, prompts the school to shut down the event, I certainly hope that doesn't happen, but um, I... Certainly can't guarantee that it won't. Um, But this, as always, of course, we know this is what anti-fascists do. If you're against fascism, you you make threats and you use intimidation 
to stop people from talking about things and from seeing films. That's what the anti-fascists do, obviously. Now, in happier news, this is from the Daily Wire. This former congresswoman and Democratic presidential candidate Tulsi Gabbard said Tuesday that she was leaving the Democratic Party because it had become an elitist cabal of warmongers driven by cowardly wokeness. Gabbard, who represents, uh, or rather represented, Hawaii's uh, second congressional district after serving two combat tours in the Middle East, made the announcement in a video posted to her social media accounts early Tuesday morning. And this is now trending all over the place. And uh, let's watch it. I can no longer remain in today's Democratic Party that's under the complete control of an elitist cabal of warmongers who are driven by cowardly wokeness, who divide us by racializing every issue and stoking anti-white racism, who actively work to undermine our God-given freedoms that are enshrined in our Constitution, who are hostile to people of faith and spirituality, who demonize the police but protect criminals at the expense of law-abiding Americans, who believe in open borders, who weaponize the national security state to go after their political opponents, and above all, who are dragging us ever closer to nuclear war. Now, I believe in a government that's of the people, by the people, and for the people. Unfortunately, today's Democratic Party does not. Instead, it stands for a government that is of, by, and for the powerful elite. Now, I'm calling on my fellow common sense, independent-minded Democrats to join me in leaving the Democratic Party. If you can no longer stomach the direction that the so-called woke Democratic Party ideologues are taking our country, then I invite you to join me. Well, that's what needs to happen. I mean, honestly, I'm tired of people giving so much credit to uh, the supposedly reasonable Democrats like Cinema and Manchin. And uh, well, I guess those are the only ones, but they get credit sometimes from uh, from the right because they take positions on occasion that are um, outside of the Democrat mainstream because the Democrat mainstream is off the cliff into, you know, into far left insanity. Uh, but they get they get credit, but, they, but then they they remain in the Democratic Party. They stay aligned with it, and ultimately they do always end up bending the knee when it really when it really matters when it really counts. They're going to go along with what the Democrats want. Uh, at a certain point, you have to realize, as Tulsi Gabbard has, that the Democrat Party is lost. It's just it's lost. And so, if you really are a reasonable common sense person, and notice I say reasonable common sense. You don't even need to be a conservative. Now, I think that reason and common sense will lead you to in that direction. But you don't need to see yourself in that light. But if you're just reasonable and you have common sense, then you, you, the Democrat Party is lost to you. And it's not coming back. Just like if you're on a, if you're on a ship and it's, it's sinking into the dark icy sea, it's not going to matter much if you're the most reasonable one on board. It doesn't matter, you know, if you tried to, Warn the captain about the iceberg before he hit it. And he didn't listen to you. Uh, well, that that mattered before. Maybe being the smartest, and most common sense guy on the ship before it's sinking and hits the iceberg, that might matter. But now it's going, it's going in the water. Um, and if you stay on, then you're going to be part of the deb- debris, part of the wreckage, like everybody else. You have to ab- abandon the ship. It's too late to bail it out and plug the holes when the whole starboard side is already in the water, and I'm quickly running out of uh, ship terminology to keep the metaphor going, but you, you, get the, you get the basic idea. So this is good. Now, as, as some people have pointed out, Tulsi Gabbard is not a conservative on every issue. She also didn't say that she's becoming a Republican. Maybe she will, maybe she won't. I don't know. I don't think that really even matters that much. I don't care if she does or doesn't. Uh, is she a conservative on every issue? As far as I know, no, uh, she's not. Last I checked, last last I heard her talking about it, she was pro-abortion, for example. Uh, she's not exactly a gun rights proponent. But the good news also is that uh, is that she's someone who can be reached. You know, I, I don't know this, but another five years from now, it wouldn't be surprised. It wouldn't surprise me if she was also pro-life. Given that she is open to listening to what people have to say, and she does have common sense. But I want you to notice something else. Notice the difference This is really the most important thing and the most striking contrast. Because there have also been Republicans on the other side over the last several years 
who have left the Republican Party and have made a big announcement about it and said uh, that I'm leaving and, and everything. And then, and then they explain why they're leaving. And there are certain Republicans who have announced that they're leaving the Republican Party about 46 times at this point. I think uh, Jennifer Rubin at the Washington Post, she has left the Republican Party. I think, I think most recently she was on her um, 1,000th occasion of leaving it. So, but you, you listen to them. So when Republicans say, well, we're leaving the Republican Party, especially over the last few years when this has happened, on almost every occasion, it's because of Trump. And they tell you that. They lay out their reasons, and it always comes down to Trump. When they're giving their speech about why they're leaving, they're going to say the word Trump or MAGA 50 times because it all comes down to this one guy. It's this one guy they don't like, a guy who's currently not even in elected office, this one guy they don't like, and that's why they're leaving. Now, on the other hand, listen to Tulsi Gabbard leaving the Democrat Party. I don't think she even mentions Joe Biden at all. Maybe she did, and I missed it, but... That certainly was not the central focus of her reasoning. And uh, if Joe Biden wasn't on the scene, she, you get the impression she would still feel the same way. Because she's leaving for a whole host of reasons that all have, that are principled, and they have to do with the ideas and the, the actual political agenda of the Democrat Party, which she disagrees with. So she's not having a temper tantrum because she doesn't like one person on the Democrat Party side of it. It's because she, the, the entire platform she rejects and she lays out all of, the, all of the fundamental flaws with the Democrat platform. So a very different sort of thing. All right. So that was an impressive speech there from Tulsi Gabbard. We'll go to something a little bit less impressive. Addressing the media yesterday, the Secretary of the Army, Christine Wormuth, had some thoughts about the attacks on wokeness. And uh, here's what she says. And one more thing, Haley, I would emphasize is I think um, more broadly in terms of, you know, soldiers coming from um, marginalized communities or, you know, demographics that are not widely represented in the Army, that's part of why we've got to emphasize positive command climates and inclusion. You know, we get criticized, frankly, sometimes for being woke, I'm not sure what woke means. I think woke means a lot of different things to different people. Um, but first of all, I would say if, if woke means, you know, we are not focused on war fighting, we are not focused on readiness, that doesn't reflect what I see at installations all around the country or overseas when I go and visit. But I think, you know, we do have a wide range of soldiers in our army, and we've got to make them all feel included. And that's why a lot of our diversity, equity, and inclusion programs are important. She just, she looks and sounds like, uh, like any human resources director at some Fortune 500 company, or maybe not even a company as impressive as that. Like she's, she just sounds like she's just any, or, or the, you know, guidance counselor at some uh, middle school. That's what she sounds like and looks like. And yet she's the secretary of the army. She's one of the people in charge of our armed forces at the bureaucratic level. That's, you can call it whatever you want. You call it wokeness. I don't care what you call it, but that's the problem. And, and you know what? She, she says, uh, well, I don't know what this wokeness thing is. I don't care about wokeness. I don't know if it's good or bad. But, uh, but the, the most important thing is that we, we make everyone in the army feel included. Yeah, that's that's wokeness, okay, Amy. Just to make just be, be clear with you, that's what it is. That's what we're objecting to. Make everyone feel included. <laughs> that's the first of all. That should be the exact opposite, especially going through the recruiting process and the training process. There should be very little concern for people's feelings at all, because that's not going to help you on the battlefield. But just including people for the sake of including them, that's not the appropriate way to go through the recruiting process for any institution, let alone the military. In fact, re recruitment and training and bringing people in to an institution, whether it's the military or something else, is a process of discrimination. You are discriminating 
You should have discriminating standards. There, there's no other kind of standard to have. If you have standards at all, it is going to be discriminating standards because you are uh, differentiating one thing from another. You're saying we want this and not that. That's, you're discriminating. That's what it is. That's what the word means. I'm fine uh, getting rid of uh, wokeness. We don't need to talk about wokeness in the military. I mean, it is woke, but uh, let's just use the term that they use, inclusivity. They say, it's not wokeness, it's inclusivity. Yeah, it's the same thing, but fine. I'm, I'm fine just talking about that. Inclusivity. Inclusivity is destroying the military, just like it's destroying so many other institutions, so many other once great institutions. Because when you include everyone just for the inclusivity for its own sake, throwing the doors open and saying anyone can come, it doesn't matter, there's no standards, obviously that's going to have a poisonous effect on that institution. All right, Uh, this is from the Daily Wire. Singer Lizzo answered critics of her weight and the fat acceptance movement during a concert on Friday. Yay, the rapper formerly known as Kanye West. We just call him Kanye West. I feel like we just still still just call him that. I don't want to misgender, but Um, Kanye West on Thursday told Fox News Tucker Carlson that Lizzo, whom he considers a friend, has been criticized for losing weight, something he found extremely troubling and tied it to a larger targeting of black Americans. Lizzo told her fans at Toronto's um, Scotiabank Arena, I feel like everybody in America got my mother effing name in their mother effing mouth for no mother effing reason. I'm minding my fat, black, beautiful business. That's, that's what she said. Everyone's talking about me. I don't know why. Look, you know, there have always been, of course, pop stars who, uh, who are provocative. That's as long as pop music has existed. It's thrived on that sort of thing. You know, p- publicity stunts and, and everything else. But it seems as though, in the past anyway, people who tried to get attention and then got the attention they asked for, would then use that attention for whatever purpose they had in mind, or they would brag about the fact that everyone's talking about them and how famous they are. You know, it, was, it was really you know, very brash and showy in that way. Now, though, we have this game where they desperately flail around looking for attention, and then as soon as they get it, they cry. That's the process now. So the first part of it is not that different. Lizzo, now Lizzo being morbidly obese, running around naked and everything in thongs, that's not something you saw in pop music up until the last few years. But the general thing of just like flaunting around and, and, and being half naked and just trying to get attention, oh, yeah, that we've seen. Okay, so I, yes, I, we, we can all agree that that's, that's pretty standard fare. But the next part is not. I mean, the next, the next part strikes me as pretty uniquely modern. Are you desperately, desperately clawing for attention, which is all Lizzo ever does. She desperately clawing for attention all the time. Okay, you don't, whether you're morbidly obese or not, you don't walk around in public and see through outfits unless you want people to look at you. So when you're, when you're going through your closet and you've got all your outfits there and you're thinking to yourself, I, you know, I really want to be incognito today. I don't want people to notice me. I just want to get in and out. I want to run to Walmart. I got to grab a couple things. Uh, I need some new, uh, you know, sponges and Windex or whatever from Walmart. And I I don't want to be bothered. Well, you're not going to then grab for the see-through thong on that occasion. Maybe this analogy doesn't really work that well because it does seem like that's the sort of thing people do wear to Walmart all the time. But you you get my point. Generally, it seems like if you don't want attention, you're not going to go with that sort of uh, get up. And that's what she does because she wants the attention. And then she gets it, and she just never stops crying about it. Because that's what the attention is for. It's, it's, you, know, you want to generate the attention, and then you want to convert. There's this conversion process. Attention on its own doesn't do any, anyone any good. You've got to be able to convert the attention into something. And we live in a, in a, um, in a victimhood economy, and so she converts the attention into victimhood tokens is essentially how it works. All right. I've had this story on the the docket here for a few days, and I want to finally um, spend a couple minutes talking about it. It, it, It's a horrifying story. It's hard to even read, but uh, maybe you've already heard this. A Tennessee mother of two is now in stable condition with stitches and bite marks over her entire body after attempting to intervene when her two pit bulls mauled her toddlers to death on Wednesday. This was last Wednesday. 
Kirstie Jane Bernard, 30, was severely injured by the dogs when she tried to pull them off of her five-year-old, or rather five-month-old boy, Hollis Dean, and two-year-old girl, Lily Jane, just outside of their home in Shelby County. Both of the children were pronounced dead at the scene. Uh, Bernard's condition is reportedly stable, but the mother has an un- uncountable amount of stitches and white marks over her entire body, including her face. Uh, the more details on the attack that are you know, circulating in the media, it's just... It, it, it's unthinkable. I, you can't even wrap your head around it. Uh, and whether you have kids or not, you obviously see this as a horrific tragedy. When you do have kids, then you can't help but sort of imagine yourself in that situation. And it's uh, enough to take the breath away. But it, it is another occasion for us, to, for us to point out that it's, it's like enough already. Okay. It's like how, how, how many kids need to be mauled to death for the sake of pit bull ownership? Like at, at what point can we all just agree that it's, it's too much? And these animals, they don't belong in communities. They don't belong in, in homes, they especially don't belong in homes with little kids. You know, there, there are basic facts here. Pit bulls are responsible for almost all of the deadly dog attacks in the country every year. Okay. Almost all of them are pit bulls. Almost all. Vast majority. Pit bulls and Rottweilers make up like, um, you know, 6% of the dog population overall. They account for almost 80% of the fatal attacks. And pit bulls are 70% of that 80%. So it's almost all pit bulls and you throw in a couple Rottweilers and that's pretty much it. That, that's all the dogs that are killing people. Pit bulls account for uh, 70, like I said, 70% of the fatal attacks. And that's why Every time you read a story, you see a headline about a dog fatally mauling someone, oftentimes a kid or an elderly person, you could just assume ahead of time that's a pit bull and you're almost always right. Okay, when you start seeing patterns like this, it should tell you something. When you see a headline and dogs, dog mauls, fatal dog mauling, and immediately you say, well, that's a pit bull, and you're almost never wrong in that assumption... Maybe that should tell us something. Even with non-fatal injuries, pit bulls are responsible for well over half, 60%, despite being such a small portion of the overall dog, dog population. And please don't respond by telling me, well, you know, poodles are even more aggressive. They bite more people. Poodles don't maul people to death. Okay, they might give you a little nip on the hand and it'll hurt. You might need, maybe you need to get stitches in a worst case scenario. Okay, there, there are also, uh, you know, maybe hamsters are more likely to bite you than a pit bull. That might be true. I don't know. They're not going to kill you, though, is the point. It's the same reason we don't, it's, you're not allowed to, to purchase like a lion and have it walking around in a community. Now, it doesn't matter. You could, you could all, all day you could tell me, well, you know, there's only a, there's only a 2% chance that the lion would even attack you. I think that's probably not true, but even, but if it is, yeah, but in the 2% scenario, I'm just dead. Like, that's it. So we're rolling the dice. And, and I don't really want to roll those dice. Why should I have to roll those dice? Because you want to have a pet. Um, they are bred this way. They just are. They are bred to have hair triggers. And when they attack, to keep attacking until the victim is dead. Not all dogs are like that. You know, there, again, there are some dogs that, that might... Be inclined to bite also, but they're not going to keep mauling you until you stop moving. That's just, that's just how they're bred. It's a statistical reality. And you can blame the owners all you want. But it's another fact that most of the time when there's a pit bull attack, we hear that the dog never acted like this before. He's perf- they're perfectly peaceful dogs. That was the case in this, in this tragic case. These were two pit bulls that had both been owned by the, by the parents for like seven or eight years. And they're telling us it never attacked anyone, never shown any aggression. And then one day they kill two people, two, two kids. So, like, even if it was true that most of the pit bull attacks can be traced back to bad ownership, that, that doesn't help you any as a pit bull apologist because, like, there are a lot of bad owners out there. And so if my neighbor moves the next door with a pit bull, I, I just have to trust that he's one of the good owners it doesn't seem very fair. I got to trust. So for my own, kid, my children's safety, I got to just tr- hope that they're very good owners. There are a lot of animals, a lot of very dangerous animals that if you're a very good owner, 
you can really mitigate the risks of owning those animals. And yet we would still say you cannot own those animals. You especially cannot not own them in a neighborhood. And you especially should not own them if you have small kids in your house. I don't know how we don't put pit bulls into that same category. And please, all I ask you is anytime this comes up, the first thing we hear is, well, you sound just like people that are anti-gun. Please don't do that. Please don't embarrass yourself. I'm asking you. Don't do that. Okay? Dogs are not guns. These are two different things. You also have a constitutional right to bear arms. You don't have a constitutional right to own pets. If you did, then you would be able to own an elephant or, an, or, a, or a tiger. You obviously don't have a constitutional right to just own whatever animal you want. Don't be ridiculous. You do have a constitutional right to bear arms. The other thing, though, is that, that guns, you know, it's like, what do we always say as, as, as the, uh, the gun rights crowd? We say that, well, look, the gun's not just going to pick itself up one day and start shooting. Blame the person, right? Well, a dog, if we're comparing a, a pit bull to a gun, then, then, then actually a pit bull is the kind of gun that just shoots itself one day. That just picks up and starts shooting because it has a mind of its own. Okay, so you've got an inanimate object to which you have a, you have a constitutional right to. And then on the other hand, you have a, 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 a dangerous animal with a mind of its own. Two different things. I just, I, I don't see, yes, I've seen some of the pictures people pass around of pit bulls. Uh, wearing shower caps or whatever, cuddling with with uh, stuffed animals, and I, I've seen some of those pictures. And yeah, some of them are kind of cute. You know, I can see a picture like that. Oh, that's cute. I mean, I, I can see a picture of a lion and think the same thing. But I don't think that the cuteness of the animal um, is a, is a good enough counter argument for the bloodshed. I don't think it mitigates the bloodshed or kids having their faces ripped off. So let's just, for God's sake, can we just, one of the issues that could be bipartisan, an actual bipartisan issue. Can we just like agree? Like, like it's, it's a dangerous animal. It's killing kids. It's just, it's not worth it. It, do, it, it just doesn't belong in, in a human community. Now let's get to the comment section. Do you know their name? They're the sweet baby gang. Rhonda says, thank you for all you're doing. I'm a huge fan and supporter and pray for your work and safety. I'm organizing a busload of people from uh, uh, Loudoun, I guess in Virginia, to come to your rally on the 21st. Is it on? Is it on no matter what? Pauses the hospital does. Will there be details coming regarding parking? How best to represent with signs, et cetera, wanting to help make a difference in the best way possible. Yeah, it's absolutely still on. So definitely bring your um, your busload of people. Uh, everyone bring busloads of people. Rally is, is not only on, but as we talked about yesterday, I think it's more important than ever right now. When you you know when you're fighting for something and you 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 win a you win a skirmish, and I think that's what this is. It's an important skirmish, but we want a skirmish with the with the uh, hospital deciding to pause. Not deciding, but being forced to pause their gender transition procedures on minors. But when you when you win that battle or that skirmish, you don't just turn around and go away. Like if you do that, then it's all for nothing. You lost. It's a, you you turn a win into a loss by turning around and saying, uh, "All right, well, we're, our work here is done." So once you get that first victory, it's all the more important to double down, and uh, that's what we're doing. So please do come out. As far as some of the logistical details, yeah, we'll have uh, we'll have a lot more for about that um, very soon. So stay tuned. All right. Um, let's see. Funk Soul Buddy says, how peer review works. You going to make money off this? Oh, yeah. You? Oh, hell yeah. What about you over there? Darn tootin', we're all there. Yeah, that's, that's basically peer review. Well, here's the real issue with peer review is that, I mean, there's, there's that. Like, as we've discussed, people involved in these studies and some of the people peer reviewing them are, have a financial interest in a certain outcome. And that alone just invalidates the study completely. Like once you realize that there are people involved in the study, people who have peer reviewed the study, who are financially invested in a certain outcome, it's just like ignore it. You don't even need to read it. That's out the window. That's not science. That's propaganda. It's absurd to even pay attention to it. Um, 
but this speaks to the underlying issue, which even if there isn't money involved, the, the peer review process assumes that the peers are credible and trustworthy. So the process of peer review and getting peer review, it can turn into a sort of like a peer pressure thing because this all, it, 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 it assumes that, that your peers are, are right in general um, and have not been compromised. And that's not the case when it comes to gender ideology. So the, the therapists, the psychiatrists, psychologists, the doctors, surgeons, endocrinologists, many people in all these fields are totally compromised. And they have bought into this ideologically, and they've also, as we said, bought into it financially. And then we hear about, well, there's a study, and they all said it's valid. Who gives up? A blankety blank what they say. Doesn't matter. Yes, I did just say who gives a blankety blank. I did. That happened. Um, Someone, creative name, says... What's sad is Matt isn't actually the smartest man on earth. He isn't the best person to have on your side in an argument. It's just everyone else is so stupid, it makes him appear like the smartest man on earth. He does still have more balls than me and is making a greater impact on the world than I probably will ever make. Thank you, Matt Walsh, for just speaking the truth. Uh, Well, I'm not going to agree with the last part of that because who who knows what kind of impact you can make on the world. You can make a, a great impact. But the first part, I will agree. Am I the smartest man on earth? Not even close. In a, you know, objectively speaking, am I the, the, always the best person to have on your side in an argument? No, I wouldn't say that I am. Um, and that's why I always say, you know, we, we, we live at a time right now, sort of the advantage that we have with, with the, the whole world going insane and the left going insane is that you don't need to be. You, you don't need to be a genius to, inter, to engage and to get in there and to make arguments and to win the arguments. If you needed to be a genius, I would not be in front of this camera right now, and you would not be listening to me. Um, all right. Paul says, Matt, Columbus technically didn't discover the new world for the Europeans. Norway had known about America for nearly 500 years at the time, thanks to Eric the Red, who discovered and landed on Greenland, and Leif Erikson, who discovered and landed on uh, mainland North America. Yeah, that always comes up with Columbus. Now, now first of all, the fact that... Um, the fact that there were uh, Vikings centuries before who had spotted or, or even landed on the mainland North America, that in no way undercuts the significance or the impressiveness of Columbus's uh, journey. But the other part of it is that like, they didn't establish lasting colonies on the mainland of North America. And um, Columbus did. So that's, that's part of the discovery process is you have to go and find the place. Um, but then you also have to establish the contact and establish uh, colonies. And that's, that's part of the process. So it doesn't take away from Leif Erikson. Not saying it does, but it also doesn't take away from Columbus. Uh, and, and we know that this is the case throughout history, that discovery is, uh, is a process and you know, it's it's very rarely that just one guy all on his own just stumbles across something or discovers something. There's always, you know, it's always a, a process of building. And there are multiple people who can, you know, arguably take credit for certain aspects of the discovery. That's, that's it's always been that way. Um, let's see. Brando says, Matt, Lauren Southern is making content like The Daily Wire is, has been doing so for years. I'm sure she would appreciate a huge corporation like you guys giving her a shout out, just saying, she makes incredible content. I know she just put up a video with a detransitioner uh, herself that's on her channel. You should go check out. Big uh, Lauren Southern fan for sure. She does great work. And finally, Milton says, Matt, your attacks on Christian pastors are unfair and disappointing. It's not a pastor's job to be a culture warrior. Their job is to shepherd their flock in their churches. Your generalized statements are uncalled for and strike me as unchristian. Okay. First of all, criticizing church leadership is one of the most Christian things you can do in the world. Historically speaking, there's a long tradition of Christians criticizing, and in very harsh terms, oftentimes, church leadership. Uh, you know, there, there are multiple, just put it into perspective, there are multiple church fathers and old uh, saints of the church who are credited with talking about how hell is, the roads of hell are paved with the skulls of bishops, Okay. That, that, that's the kind of language that has been used to describe church leadership when they're failing 
at their job. And, and that's what we should be doing. We should be holding them accountable. Um, you say that pastors aren't called to be culture warriors. I could not disagree more. I mean, what are you talking about? They live in the culture, don't they? And so are they going to fight for it or not? I, I, I don't even understand how you could draw a distinction between, no, I, I'm worried about the shepherding my flock, not the culture. They're part of the culture. They live in the culture. Okay, unless you're going to take them off and you're all going to go to some island in the, in the Pacific somewhere and, and, and start your own commune or something, um, unless you're going to do that, then you got to worry about the culture. And that's what we're all called to do. We're all called to fight for the culture. And if Christian pastors and church leaders are not going to do it, then who is? Well, there maybe will be some people who step into the gap. But then the problem, as we talked about yesterday, is that sometimes these, uh, these Christian leaders who have, who have failed in the job or have not done it or have not been effective enough, um, then other people step into the gap to fill that void. And then those same people who failed in the job turn around and start criticizing those who stepped into the void. Hey, no, don't, don't, do, don't do it that way. Do it this way. But hey, there's room up here. Why don't you come up here and do it? Where are you? Oh, I'm not worried about that. I'm worried about my own flock. And also, these pastors that are worried about their own flocks and their church, most churches in America are dying, okay? So I can't even accept, even if I were to agree with you, that, oh, forget about the culture, just worry about your own flock. Even that's not working. Most churches are dying. So, yes, there are some good Christian leaders and pastors, certainly. There are, there are some very, very good ones. Um, but as a whole, the proof is in the pudding here, and, and and that's the point. Well, if you know me, you know how much I love Halloween and how excited I am to dress up for the holiday. Now, I, I may have to settle for the uh, run-of-the-mill superhero costume, but uh, you know that's usually what I go. Well, I was hoping for something more creative this year. I always get really creative on Halloween, but I don't know if that's going to happen this year. But there's still hope for you this Halloween. You could be the star of the year's breakout hit documentary, What is a Woman? That's right. You can head over to, I have no idea where this is going. What is this? Head over to dailywire.com slash shop to get your very own Matt Walsh Halloween costume. Do I get to approve this? So we, we're putting a, a costume of my likeness on the site and no one even told me. I don't know what it looks like. Be sure to post on social media and tag me in the Daily Wire to show off your costume. Yeah, please tag me so I know what the hell it is because I don't know what it is. Do I, do I get to consent in being made into a costume? I don't get to consent. It's just I was just made into a costume and no one even asked me. I'm not sure that I want anyone to do this. Anyway, you might even make it on the show. Remember, not all heroes wear capes. This one wears a sandwich board. Luscious beard and contrarian attitude not included. So there's no beard included? This is a Matt Walsh costume? What? Okay. It's like if it's a Freddy Krueger costume. You don't have the, you know, the, the spiky hands or whatever. He's the one with the spiky hands, right? Um... Also, also, also this, George Floyd's death literally set the world on fire, divided America, and gave rise to the activist group Black Lives Matter. They raised $80 million through fundraising, but no one ever asked where the money went until now. On Wednesday, October 12th, Candace Owens will reveal the truth in her new documentary, The Greatest Lie Ever Sold, exclusively on Daily Wire Plus. Candace travels to Minneapolis to meet the people who knew George Floyd and Derek Chauvin. And then she follows the money to find out just where it did and did not go. After more than two years of the mainstream media ignoring the story, the answer will shock and surprise you. The longer the media stays silent, the louder we get and the more momentum we gain. So your Daily Wire Plus membership goes a long way to ensuring that folks like Candace Owens, myself, and everyone here at the Daily Wire has a megaphone uh, and can keep creating important content like this. So free speech is our greatest weapon. Remember, we're speaking for you. We're fighting for your values, too. We need to do it together as a team. If you're not a member yet, go to dailywire.com slash Walsh to subscribe and join us today and tune in this week to watch Candace Owens' new documentary, The Greatest Lie Ever Sold, exclusively on Daily Wire Plus. Now let's get to our daily cancellation. You know, there are things in this life of ours that are simply made for the daily cancellation, destined for it, a story written in the stars before time began. Sometimes people and events come together in such a way as to combine and form something so obnoxious and so cringy and so vile and so stupid and so hilarious um, in all the wrongest ways that it's not even necessary for me to say anything and explaining why I'm canceling it. Though I will st still you know, say things, lots of things, because this is a podcast and that's what I do here. Without further ado, here is the story from Fox. It says, former First Lady Michelle Obama's voting initiative is partnering with a dating app that made a video titled No Voting, No Vucking, with a V. 
Um, now, you've probably already heard more than enough, but you're going to hear much more, far more than is necessary or decent, I have to tell you. So continuing, the voting initiative when we all vote, announced uh, that it would be working with the BLK dating app on October 4th and doing voter registration activations within the company. The BLK dating app is designed for black singles looking to date, according to its website. On October 4th, the organization released a video encouraging black voters to go to the polls titled No Voting, No Vucking, which features Rashad Spain, known as Saucy Santana, and Katrina Taylor, who is known as Trina. So just to make sure you understand, Michelle Obama, who used to be the first lady of the United States, is partnering through her voting initiative with a dating app, which just released a a Get Out the Vote rap song starring something called Saucy Santana, in which black singles are encouraged to ransom their bodies sexually in order to convince people to vote. So now you're all caught up. That's what's happening. If you think you're going, to get, you're going to get through this segment and escape it without actually having to hear the song, well, you don't know me very well because here it is. Yeah. 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 Check, check. I think we got one. <laughs> it's voting season, bruh. Now voting, no loving. Now voting, no touch. Now voting, no nothing. Now voting, no fucking, no voting, no fucking. Now voting, no loving. Now voting, no touch. Now voting, no nothing. Now voting, no fucking, no voting, no fucking. BLK app looking for some action. Why the homie Scott was heading. Face is a nine, abs a ten, D is a mm, to be determined. <laughs> he got mad jokes, he don't seem broke. The only red flag, he said he don't vote. This, this, this midterms for all the single cues. Wanna hit this booty, gotta do your civic duty. No voting, no loving. No voting, no touch. No voting, no nothing. No voting, no fucking, no voting, no fucking. No voting, no loving. No voting, no touch. No voting, no nothing. If you want to hit this booty, better do your civic duty, he says, quoting, I believe, John Adams. Actually, that's not exactly what John Adams says. Here's here's what um, John Adams said, just uh, for comparison's sake. Here's what John Adams said in encouraging those eligible to vote. Here's what he said, quote, It becomes necessary for every citizen then to be in some degree a statesman and to examine and judge for himself of the tendency of political principles and measures. Let us examine then with a sober and manly and a Christian spirit. Let us neglect all party loyalty and advert to facts. Let us believe no man to be infallible or impeccable in government any more than in religion. Take no man's word against evidence nor implicitly adopt the sentiments of others who may be deceived themselves or may be interested in deceiving us. Now, those are the sorts of things our founding fathers said about voting. We used to be a nation that produced the sorts of men who were capable of speaking like that and saying those kinds of things. Now, we rhyme civic duty and booty. And I didn't even get to the most poetic part because the girl rapper or uh, the other girl rapper or whatever that was, I don't know what what exactly is going on, but uh, she sings in her verse, quote, don't stop now, stuff my ballot box again, but my home girl through, put the by in partisan Politics be so nasty, make me want to flirt you, show you how to be a poll worker, uh, legs in the air, I don't care. That, I believe, was adapted from the famous defense of democracy offered by the ancient Greek ruler Euclides. Um, at least that name sounds like an ancient Greek guy. I don't really feel like we're competing it. But anyway, Trina Sauce, or whatever her name is, is you know, obviously going for some kind of sex and voting metaphor, um, I guess which makes the legs in the airline all the more curious. Like, I understand that in the sexual context, but why would you put your legs in the air while voting? You know you're supposed to make your selection using your, your hand, right? I mean, use it on the voting machine, not on, on yourself. Now, what are the problems with all of this, aside from you know, the obvious sanitation issues? Well, for one thing, Democrats have again put their bigotry of no expectations on full display. It is in some ways easy for me to laugh at this because I don't identify as black. I don't identify that way anyway. And therefore, um, I'm not the one being degraded and insulted here. This is the kind of patronizing, lowest common denominator, humiliating nonsense that the left saves for their favored victim groups. 
There's a reason for that, of course, because in order to manipulate these groups, they need to be victim groups. And if you want them to retain that status, you must encourage all of the worst tendencies and behaviors while discouraging and showing open hostility to the best. This is the leftist approach to all groups, black people, women, gays, etc., except straight white men. Because when I talk about victim groups, I'm saying like every group on the planet except for straight white men. We straight white men, we are merely villainized and scapegoated 24-7. That's what we get. It's not always fun, but I prefer that to the kind of psychological warfare they wage against every other demographic. Secondly, on the other hand, I am somewhat grateful for this campaign because it reveals in all of its semi-literate horror the fundamental absurdity of nearly all modern get-out-the-vote campaigns, which you know how I feel about get-out-the-vote efforts. I am opposed to all of them. After all, why would we want people to vote just so that they can get laid? How in the hell does that benefit society or the country or democracy? What exactly is the long-term or short-term social benefit of convincing people to vote on that basis alone? Why do we try to drive voter participation at all? If somebody is clued in and they're engaged and they're informed and uh, and, and, and all of that, then they're going to vote anyway. You don't need to tell them to do it. If they aren't, why would we encourage them to vote? I don't think any get-out-the-vote effort has ever actually succeeded in encouraging the kinds of voters you actually want, because those sorts of voters, the informed and engaged ones, again, they don't need, none of them, informed, engaged uh, people who are interested in their civic duty, none of them have ever encountered a get out the vote campaign and then said to themselves, you know what? I think I will. I think I will vote. I mean, after all, if you want to get the booty, you got to do your civic duty. No one has ever done that if they're informed and engaged. It's only ever the morons who are going to be motivated by that. So how is democracy served by by this? How is it served by sheer participation? In what other context would we encourage people to do something just simply to do it, whether they're equipped or informed or competent or not? Well, college admissions is the other. So sending kids to college is the other context. So voting and sending kids to college, those are the two things where we say, just do it whether you're ready for it or not. So who is this helping? Well, the answer, of course, is that it's helping the ruling class. It's helping those in power stay in power. It's helping Michelle Obama's friends, just like it helped her husband when he was in office. Having armies of self-interested morons and ignorant, drooling buffoons vote is a, is a boon to corrupt politicians and the ruling elites and nobody else. They would certainly love it if you came out to vote simply so that you could have sex later that night. Voting with your genitals, perhaps literally in Trina's case, uh, just means you aren't using your brain, which means you're incredibly easy to use and exploit and manipulate. And that's what this is really about, as always. And that is why the no voting, no fucking with a V campaign is canceled. And that'll do it for this portion of the show as we move over to the members block. Uh, talk to you tomorrow. Godspeed.